Hello, my name is Melissa Golding, and I'm the press officer for the Group of 30. I'd like to welcome all of you to this live webinar launch of Central Banking and Monetary Policy, Principles and the Way Forward, the report of the Group of 30's Working Group on Monetary Policy. We will begin the webinar with opening remarks from the leaders of the Group of 30 Working Group on Monetary Policy, co-chairs Jacob Frankel, Raghuram Rajan, and Axel Weber, and the project director, Marcus Brunemeyer. Please note that Drs. Frankel, Rajan, Weber, and Brunemeyer will be speaking today on behalf of the Group of 30's Working Group on Monetary Policy. They are here to discuss the results of the G30 study and to answer questions about the report. They are participating in this webinar in their personal capacities, and their participation does not imply the support of their respective public and private institutions. The speakers will take questions immediately following their formal remarks. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Jacob Frankel, co-chair of the G30 Working Group on Monetary Policy. Dr. Frankel? Thank you, thank you very much, Melissa, and uh, let me welcome everyone online, and thank you for joining us. We have a great turnout today for an important G30 report on monetary policy. Let me just say a few words of background. As many of you know, the Group of 30 formed in 1978 is an independent global body comprised of economic and financial leaders from the public and the private sector and academia. It is composed of senior, former, and current central bankers, financial sector leaders, policymakers, and academics from across the globe. We make interventions in policy areas where we have expertise as a group, when we feel it is supporting the necessary debate and dialogue about economic and systemic risks and possible pathways forward. Today's launch of this report, Central Banking and Monetary Policy Principles and a Way Forward, is the product of our working group on monetary policy. This working group comprises of key members of the G30, more than 15 central bank governors and former governors, all members of the group, and it reflects the collective view of the current and former central banking governors, ministers of finance and leaders from the G30. The study was commenced as inflation spikes and policy responses in key economies appeared to be slower than warranted. My co-chairs and I felt that we need to engage, look at where mistakes were made and how we should think about the challenges ahead. A central bank tackles inflation and other risks that are now emerging. Humility is the name of the game and frankness is the name of the game. We really wanted very much to look back in order to draw the way, chart the way uh, forward. We clearly reiterate the general principles of the importance of price stability, of central bank independence, of financial stability, and we will hear from our colleagues how these features are fundamental, how they have mod been modified, but they are still with us as we look forward. Let me close by thanking Markus Brunermeyer, the project director for his tireless efforts and careful drafting of the working group paper, and of course, thanking the uh, leaders of the G30 office, uh, Stuart McIntosh and his colleagues. So let me return now and turn to Marcus, who is going to make the formal presentation. Marcus, the floor is yours. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to launch the report and outline the first thoughts about it. As uh, Jacob mentioned, uh, this report also highlighting again the strengths of the basic principles of central banking, but also looking forward, you know, what are the changes and challenges we are facing at the moment and what are the implications then for central banking? And one thing which is very important is that what we have learned 
is that there is a challenge how to predict future inflation, how to predict future GDP growth, and many of the predictability is much more challenging in a world where we face a multiple crisis. And the important aspect from this one follows from this is that the central bank should become more humble and there should be a humbler approach of central banking. And I will outline what this implies in more detail on the next slide. The second challenge is that we live in a world with much higher government debt level. That means whenever there is an interest rate increase by the central bank, it has much bigger fiscal implications. So we predict the tensions between the fiscal and monetary authorities will be more severe. And this calls for a much more emphasis on central bank independence. So central banks have to be strengthened in their independence because the challenges will be more demanding. It also has some implications on interest rate on reserves and so forth. The third is that also not only the public debt level is high, the private debt level is also high, and we face much higher inflation. And we had, you know, a dependence of the private market on a very loose monetary policy for a long time. That changes the dynamics between price and financial stability and the danger of financial dominance. And finally, there we are in a phase of huge transition phase of many structural changes. And this implies changes to our star and also to the risk premium. Uh, in, and this has to be you know, also taken into account when conducting monetary policy. Now, let me start with the first point, the, the predictability aspect. So we have to be more realistic about our ability of forecasting inflation, in particular, long way, uh, the long distance. And we also have to be aware that many of our tools, be it uh, VARs, VARs, and DSG models, they are baked in, and the models are baked in that everything comes back to the desired level again. So here's just some figures where you see the forecasts, the so-called hair diagrams, where the forecast always came back down, but actually, indeed, it didn't realize. So people expected a transitory problem, but it did not turn out to be transitory. These are the numbers from the US Fed, but the numbers are similar if you go to the ECB and so forth. And many, many central banks, in the advanced central banks, they had these models which were essentially not allowing that this could be a permanent uh, phenomenon. Now, this calls you know, more realism or more humbleness in how much we can forecast a future inflation. The second component of humbleness means that we want to have preserve future policy space. We don't want to limit that we can't do something. And there are some hidden ways where we actually reduce the future policy space. So we have some prolonged interventions. We have to be careful of prolonged, prolonged interventions. We want to keep the flexibility to act when dangers come up. So we need that. So we also want to avoid some high hidden forward guidance. So we have this framework of a data-driven policy, which was actually a secret way of saying, or a hidden way of saying, that we actually don't raise interest rates early on. So we want to get rid of this hidden forward guidance, in a sense. Similarly, not only data-driven policy, but also this sequencing promises that first QE has to be completed before we can raise interest rates. All of these actually limited future policy space, and that hindered actually the response uh, severely. The third point is that we would like to have rules which are simple and transparent. So simplicity, the communication to the public is very important, also to have a good inflation anchor. So we have to act swiftly, um, and because if, if that's why it's important that we don't have some limitation to our policy space from past policy measures. And then we also have to really make sure that inflation anchor is maintained. So that's one of the key principles, which is a standard principle, which uh, always is there to really maintain the inflation anchor. The second point, as I pointed out, was this high public debt. So what is different? We have this huge high public debt, and any monetary tightening will actually lead to large fiscal implications on the budget. And there's a danger of fiscal dominance in this. And that's essentially a challenge central banks will face. And that means to two things in particular, central bank communication, not only to the market, but also to the public becomes very important to dominate or to control the narrative. What is going on is very, very important. And there is potentially the danger of a blame game coming. Who is to blame for the high inflation? Who is to blame for the bad economic situation? And this uh, blame game, the, the central banks have to through clever communication, they have to control uh, essentially the narrative. 
As I mentioned before, it's also important to have and maintain central bank independence and actually to strengthen central bank independence. What does this mean? In practice, it means many, many things. Of course, the legal independence is very important, but on top of it, central banks should be well capitalized. And the way we argue the central bank capitalization should be measured is not necessarily in dollars or euros, yen or pounds, but it should be measured in risk terms. So if the world is more risky, the central bank is also equity, the economic equity is, is more volatile, so we should actually measure it in risk terms. We also have to take into account that there's some headline risk, even though uh, the central banks can have negative accounting equity, there's still some headline risk, which then, you know, causes negative news to uh, the market. So, and of course, if the central bank is not well capitalized, they might be reluctant to offload or realize losses from long dated assets that did of, of, had from QE measures or to delay some QT measures and so forth. And this might actually then create, cause another trap. As another aspect which becomes will become increasingly important is that we pay now huge interest payments to the private banks because we have huge amounts of excess reserves. And these huge amounts of excess reserves, they actually drain the profits from the central bank and also ultimately from the, the citizens or the, the, the government. And this call, by cause also tensions when there's the news, you know, this, the central bank is paying X billion uh, dollars to the private banks and the private banks is not, are not paying any interest on uh, their checking or saving account or very little interest. And there's of course a new tool which has to be thought of more actively thought about and they've really evaluated to what extent one might shift the excess reserves requirements or not, uh, given that in, on required reserves, there's no interest rate paid on excess reserves, there's interest rate paid. And this, you know, can be several billions. And in a world where the, the budget is very tight, in particular, if you tighten interest rate, this might be another consideration one has to take into account. The third point we wanted to make is on the, on the private debt side, on the financial dominance thing. So there's a trade-off between price stability and financial stability. And when inflation is low, uh, the, the trade-off is not so dramatic, but one has to be careful not to undertake some pro prolonged interventions because then the market gets addicted to the accommodative uh, policies of the central bank. And you can see this very nicely from this graph. You see here on the one hand, how the, the stock markets in the top five markets is evolving and how the central bank interventions are evolving. So in the top five central banks are evolving, you see there's, there's at least a correlation between the two. And so one has to make sure that, you know, the markets are primarily driven by the central banks um, and become addicted uh, to what's going on. Now in a high inflation environment, there are, very, there are also in the short run already trade-offs. So price and financial stability, you see some strong trade-offs. And often it is argued there's a separation principle between monetary and financial stability. And one can keep, keep this separate. We are very worried that, you know, this separation principle might hold in normal times, but then might suddenly disappear in extreme times. So one has to be more careful not to rely on a separation principle, which might not be there when you really then need it. And if the market thinks that whenever there's some financial stability issues, this, the central bank cannot fight inflation, this will immediately translate in high inflation expectations, and then it becomes a self-fulfilling instrument as well. So what do you need to do in this setting? Again, it's from an ex-ante perspective, very important to have macro and micro potential policies in place, very strong policies in place in order to have the policy space that can react when inflation gets out of hand. And also make sure that you have the policy space, you don't lock yourself in because you have some prolonged interventions ex ante and you can't get out of these prolonged interventions. The fourth point is about emerging economies. The fourth section of the report is on emerging economies. And one important point we wanted to make that the emerging economies, they saw the last inflation coming up and, that, and acted based on that. So they were not part of the transitory team. They had less of a fear of this Japanification. And that's why they behaved uh, more aggressively and kept 
uh, many difficulties which typically emerge in times when the advanced economies hike interest rates dramatically and lead to flight to safety, that was really contained this way. So the emerging economies, central banks behaved in much more, in a, had a role model essentially, and they are safe as a role model for advanced economies in this. So because there's always advanced monetary policy might cause spillovers from uh, safe haven currencies. And there's a sharp increase in advanced interest rates, what we experience, that typically leads to flight to safety capital flows. We didn't see that. Nevertheless, emerging economies should also make sure that their government debt remains a local safe asset status and has within their frame also some negative beta. So when there's a crisis in their country, the government debt is also appreciating rather than depreciating. That still asks for acting early for the emerging economies, but they had essentially acted, many of them acted as a role model and did it this way uh, anyway. So let me conclude and come back to the four points I mentioned in the initial slide. Uh, what's new? The predictability is much more challenging. We have a lot of crisis. We call for a humble approach. Second thing is tensions between fiscal monetary authorities will be more severe. Independence is key. Paying interest on reserves shifting the required reserves with excess reserves is important. How to measure capitalization of the central bank uh, it should be changed or can be really thought. Third point is the private financial dominance component is something to watch out for. And then we have structural changes. Uh, for the structural changes, this might shift our star. We have to get the handle how to measure how does the our star is affected, how is the risk premium affected without financial frictions and with financial frictions. And finally, emerging economies showed us essentially how to behave uh, and how to act early and get uh, ahead of the game. So thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity. That gives you a rough overview of what the report is about. And I think the members of the chairman, chairman of the team and their elaborate will elaborate in more detail in the various points and things which are left out to the short time frame ahead. Thanks again. Melissa, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Brunemeyer. Now we'll hear from Jacob Frankel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we will hear in sequence uh, the three co-chairs of this project uh, and already uh, Marcus has presented the key issues. So let me just, in order to put a little bit uh, color into the context, uh, I want to repeat again, we, the G30 is a very collegial group and is priding itself of having open and frank discussion. And uh, also the almost the profile of many of the members, clearly of the co-chairs of this project, is uh, very similar in a way. We have all have had academic background. We have all been in a multinational or multilateral organizations. We have all been governors of central banks. In other words, uh, we are clearly understanding that comments and discussion are part of the progress. And therefore, it's not an issue of uh, uh, who made mistake and why, but rather what can we learn from the situation. The situation is clearly very, very different than what it used to be. The financial system is more complex. The world is more complex. So the, when there is more complexity, the tendency occasionally is to say, so let's define and design complex models and complex tools to accommodate the complexity of the world. In fact, our approach is fundamentally the opposite. Because of the complexity, we should not pretend that we can predict up to the third decimal point. And because of the complexity, we should have a very well-defined objective that is accountable and can be uh, measured in real time. And that can be actually, tran and transparency has become very important so, rather than clouds. So this is the reason why we end up saying also the objective of central banking should be more narrow than what has evolved recently. Focus on the core competence of monetary policy, and that's why price stability was so, is so important, financial stability and the like. The mandate of central banks recently has expanded itself 
probably beyond the optimum in the sense that uh, central banks cannot deliver on many, many important issues, but they are not in their field of competence and comparative advantage. So that's a very sharp message that needs to be addressed. In the past few years, central banks have become, as they call it, the only game in town. And that's a very mixed blessing. And at the end, we should really come back to, as we normalize policies, we also need to normalize perspective and focuses. The second point that I want to make is that uh, uh, the importance of price stability. For many years, especially in the previous decade, the focus of central banks has been how to raise inflation from the low or negative territory. And therefore, a generation of central bankers have been raised on the dictum that we need to uh, accommodate and make sure that we have expansionary policies and the like. You know, when the road turns to the right, you should use the wheel to turn to the right. But when the road turns to the left, turn the wheel to the other direction. So we don't need to be dogmatic about it, but what we should realize is that the cost of departure from price stability is very, very high. And there are enough examples in the world that demonstrate this, which means also because of the functioning of capital markets, that if inflation deviates from its objective in a very significant way, it can become entrenched and it can translate itself into expectations and contracts, and then it will be much more difficult to do it. So therefore, coming from behind is not just that you are lagging, but you're also increasing the cost of the distortion. And that's very important. And this is then the final remark, which already was alluded to by Marcus, the issue of data dependence and the structure of models. Models by definition, are built on the experience of the past, which is of course natural. You need to learn from the past. But if the future is fundamentally different than the past, then relying on the past is a liability rather than an asset. So we should really be both humble, but also less rigid to wait for all the data to come before we act. If you do, data dependence to be defined as, I will wait for the data to tell me what to do, then you are building into your structure coming from behind. And then you will become, you will miss the curve. And we have seen that there are some costs. And the cost is not only being away from equilibrium for a long time, but also the cost of returning to equilibrium once you have deviated from it in long time. So therefore, steady as you go, don't uh, move on the road too, light, too much to the right and too much to the left. Don't change pace. Don't try to be cute. Just focus on the main competence. Thank you very much. And let me stop here and uh, return to Melissa. Thank you very much, Dr. Frankel. We will now hear from Axel Weber. Thank you, Melissa. And uh, in the very same vein, let me first thank Marcos for all the work uh, that he did and also for the uh, very good way that he presented the report in, in a very stylized and uh, concrete and condensed form. Let me uh, look back a bit. Um, we did a paper already in a group of 30 with some of the co-authors and the working group on board in 2015. The paper in 2015 was Fundamentals of Central Banking, Lessons from the Crisis. And the approach we had was we did not write this paper during the financial crisis. We wrote it with some distance to the financial crisis, not to talk about what went wrong and who did what, but really to learn the lessons of whether monetary policy reaction to the financial crisis and the whole framework of central banking, which very often have been entrusted with many more tasks than just controlling uh, monetary policy, uh, supervision, uh, financial stability, many, many areas. Uh, to look at whether that framework worked well during the financial crisis and where adjustments may be needed. Pretty much in the same vein, I look at where we are now at the back end of what I would prefer to call a cost of living crisis. On top of many other crises we've seen, we've seen disruptions in geopolitics, we've seen many, many uh, things happen, the poly crisis, as many call it. But we wanted to concentrate on a what do we learn from this crisis if we go back 
to the very fundamentals we talked about in the 2015 paper. And in that vein, I think where we are now, there are a couple of calls in this paper. And let me start with the one that uh, basically um, I, I find is very important and Jacob made it, uh, Marcus made it. So I repeat it a third time. Uh, I heard somewhere that if you repeat things three times, they stick. Well, uh, central banks should rely more on simple and transparent rules. Simplicity is not a lack of understanding complexity. It's the ability to understand complexity and reduce it to simplicity in order to take robust decisions. So in that way, uh, we feel that uh, over the last years, the ability of central banks to fine tune the economy, to fine tune inflation, and to make longer term commitments and predictions that would guide policy, we find that that was somewhat overstretched in the recent period. And we call for more reliance on simpler rule, back to basics, as Jacob said, transparency is the issue. Pursuing discretionary monetary policy measures repeatedly tends to undermine the ability of central banks to act consistently in the future. And Marcus talked about that with many of the newly developed frameworks, whether it was the sequencing of balance sheet versus interest rate policies, completing the one before you did the other, it was pretty obvious that some central banks like the ECB waited with first rate hikes to actually complete the quantitative tightening before starting rates. And we feel that such a stylized sequence of two policy tools, which basically both impact the price and quantity uh, in the market uh, that central banks work in, uh, is an artificial sequence and may not have served us as well as we had hoped. The humble approach that we, we call, uh, that we call for, basically it means that central banks should primarily, not exclusively, but primarily focus on maintaining the inflation anchor over a medium term. And the usual more policy horizon of central banks is a medium term horizon, very often operationalized as a three year forecast uh, uh, horizon. But as Marcus pointed out in some of the graphs, that three year forecast horizon can become a trap because basically what we know in economies when they get hit by shocks, if you isolate these shocks and do not impact the economy with new shocks, these shocks run through these models and ultimately the model tends to go back to its steady state calibration. And that's not a calibration that has any feedback to the economy. It's simply stylized model assumptions that you need in order to close the model on the rational expectation with a consistent policy framework for the long run. So there is a trap of these models signaling when you have more permanent shocks, much as purely transitory ones, that there is a sort of the model will do the work for you. Let me put it like that, a bit more provocative. Now, there is a sense of lack of urgency if your model predicts things will be all right in three years time. And therefore, uh, and it's a very stylized way of doing this because if you look at forecasts of uh, say the exchange rate or forecasts of oil prices, all variables where we know we know much less about the dynamics of these variables, we basically take the status quo as opposed to some mean reversion as the forecast for the future. And I think it's exactly that tension between knowing things about the economy or being uncertain about what you know that should be built into more robust policy making. Central banks should primarily uh, focus on achieving the inflation target over the medium term. That's for me the core method. And basically it is essentially the, the task of central banks and central bankers at the core of their remit. So let me add with that and pass on to Raghu Raja. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Axel. Um, I have uh, only a little to add to those wonderful statements. Uh, you know, central banks have to engage in aggressively accommodative monetary policy every once in a while. Uh, we're not against that. But monetary policy has to be thinking about the longer term and also about how its actions affect its credibility, reputation, as well as room for future actions every time it takes an action. So, for example, if you enter into a set of policy interventions, uh, we also need to think about exit. How will we exit? What circumstances will we exit in? And will they be conducive to exit? And, and the risk is that central banks, if they don't uh, focus on that also, find themselves increasingly unable to disentangle themselves from past actions. 
they become a prisoner of the past, whether we're talking about balance sheet expansion, fiscal dominance or financial dominance. These are all uh, consequences of actions the central bank has taken. So, um, you know, very, very simply, uh, um, I would emphasize three implications of all this. One, focus on the knitting. Uh, the main job of central banks is price stability. And uh, that, uh, again and again, if, uh, if that task is done well, everything else uh, accompanies that. Uh, second, and, and this is uh, my uh, sort of reading of, of the humble approach, don't necessarily go to the limit on every tool all the time for the maximum period possible. Uh, because, uh, you know, sometimes uh, that last bit, uh, the the costs exceed the benefits. And, and uh, the, the third aspect of this is normalize whenever the opportunity arises so as to create the future policy space that you will need. Uh, in other words, keep thinking about how you exit the extraordinary monetary policies you've put in place. I think if uh, if uh, these three are taken into account, uh, we're back to uh, more normal central banking, which many of us uh, would think is appropriate. Let me stop there, turn it back to Melissa. Thank you, Dr. Rajan. We will begin answering audience questions now. If you'd like to submit a question, please use the Q&A box visible at the bottom of your screen and include your name and affiliation. Our first question is from Pinho Ribeiro, an economist at the Bank of Mozambique. Some central banks and advanced countries have shifted to a data-dependent approach to decide on the course of interest rate monetary policy. Given that monetary policy formulation has always emphasized the importance of being forward-looking, are we now witnessing a shift in the paradigm from forward-looking basis to a current state of the economy basis? If we are indeed shifting, what is the role of expectations and forecasts in this new paradigm? What do we think about monetary policy transmission and its lags? Uh, Jacob, you want to allocate uh, uh, speaking responsibilities? Uh, you're on mute. We will do. We will do the CFL like we do in our group. Uh, so whoever comes in will come in, and uh, once we want to move to the next one, we'll move on. So people in the audience will know how we function between us. If you want, uh, since you invited, you gave me the microphone, I will only say one word uh, about this profound question, and I'll be very brief about it. It sounds like uh, uh, you describe the choice between data dependence and forward looking as, uh, as something which is uh, not mutually, as something which is mutually exclusive. So let me just suggest in terms of terminology, how to reconcile the two. Just add the word expected. So instead of data dependence, I'd rather say expected data dependence. And then you are indeed basing your policy on data, but the relevant data is what you expect. And here comes a little bit of a trap because in order to have your expectation, you need to have a, a model in one way or another. And many of the models, have failed and that's where the humility comes in. But it means that it's not free for all, but there are some perimeters to the range that we are operating in. Thank you. Just to add to that, um, I think the, um, I mean, I, I actually uh, sympathize uh, with central banks when they say data dependent, because it means that uh, they're, sort of out of the range of their models and they're, uh, they're, the economy hasn't really cooperated with what they thought would be the environment. And so they're in a sense uh, reflecting their humility by saying, let's see how it turns out because we cannot forecast with great precision at this point. But I, I think the point that Jacob made that this is not inconsistent with, uh, uh, with uh, expectations but it also reflects a sense that uh, you know we uh, are out of the range of uh, of 
the way uh, um, the economy has sort of mirrored our models and we need to be a little more humble uh, and and base it a little on how the actual outturns uh, allow us to change policy. Perhaps I can chime in as well. So I agree with with Rago and Jacob that uh, you know um, data dependence is a sign that actually models is perhaps not working as well as we thought. On the other hand, data dependence could also be misused, saying, okay, we don't do anything or we act very aggressively until certain data uh, come along. And then it's essentially a hidden forward guidance. It's a, it's a commitment not to act. And I think it should not be abused in that way. I think it's very important that the central banks are data dependent, that they are driven by data and also feed it in, in some models to the extent that the models are precise enough for forecasting. But it should not be used as strategic excuse, just a hidden language that we do actually forward guidance for not acting if inflation is popping up. Maybe so, I can add one last aspect that, uh, you know, and I agree with everything my colleague said, but add one aspect. You have to look at this new period of inflation uh, running hot uh, in a period where we have pressed, we had had two or three shocks which were unprecedented in post-war history. And usually when you, I hope, I should hope that all central banks are data dependent in the way that they make their policies dependent on the economy and inflation numbers. But the key point is how confident you are about this data that you see and the models you use. And if you move to a degree of overconfidence and, you know, very, being very reliant on your models and your forecast, you basically might miss of the underlying uncertainty that uh, the world economy was subjected to, in particular in the post-COVID uh, period. And you might base your policies on, therefore, on a set of models on which you rely too much. And as Raghu said, if you do not acknowledge the uncertainty around your models and the data and the specific situation we were in, you tend to use policy tools to the extreme because one thing that uncertainty tells us is you should be more cautious in a very uncertain way. And in a way, I think the uncertainty that has erupted has led central banks to be hopefully in the future more cautious about optimizing the tool set uh, to the extreme. And therefore, I do think that data dependence cannot be taken as a reason not to act. It should be a reason to act uh, with in a measured way. And that was something that uh, I think we, we need to point out this uh, data dependence should not be an excuse to wait for the right data to come in. You will always have to do policy in a forward-looking way, uh, but the degree of confidence you have in your forecast should be a function of the aggression of your policy choices. Melissa, may I suggest that since uh, there are, I can see a lot of questions that accumulate that uh, while we will deprive ourselves from some answers, but that not all the four of us will need to address all the questions. Go ahead, yeah. Elisa, the floor is yours. Certainly, thank you. Our second question is from Kumar Pankaj, uh, Director in Monetary Policy, the Monetary Policy Department at the Reserve Bank of India. The question is, how can we analyze that central bankers are not being oversensitive while controlling inflation? I'm not sure I fully understand the the question. But well, anyone wants to understand? I think uh, perhaps I can. Uh, when you say sen over sensitive, you mean I assume the why are we so slow or why are we too timid or what? Go. Well, I think a good guiding principle here is still the Taylor principle that you know when inflation goes up, typically. The real interest rate has to go up, so the nominal interest rate has to go up by more than the inflation. And then the question is, of course, at what horizon one measures inflation. So I think in order to keep the inflation anchor anchored or prevailing, so it's really important that one has something like the Taylor principle in mind uh, on this. But of course, the other lesson which comes to mind is that you know, in the 1970s, uh, when the Fed was fighting the high inflation, it, it withdrew very quickly and then inflation popped up again. So one has to be careful in this time, this round, that one you know, says that it takes a while for monetary policy to go and have its effect. 
And this one has to calibrate, one has to calibrate nicely as well. But I think the guiding principle should be the Taylor principle in my view in this. Of course, it's difficult to say what is the R star, what is really the forward-looking inflation expectations for the next few months. And uh, it's challenging, but I think that's the whole business of central banking. Thank you. Melissa? Yes, thank you very much. Our third question is from Christopher Spink at the London Stock Exchange Group. What would be the optimal way to carry out quantitative tightening now? Um, let me let me take that. Uh, I think uh, the optimal way is cautiously. Uh, I think central banks do need to reduce their balance sheet, but they need to also have a finger, uh, a, a good sense of what uh, liquidity conditions are in the market. Um, there was a view, I think, uh, which no longer exists among central banks, that quantitative tightening would be, you know, boring, easy, uh, just reduce the balance sheet, uh, no problem. Uh, I think uh, one central banker described it as as boring as watching paint dry. Uh, it's not that because it's not just the reverse of quantitative easing. You're taking away liquidity in a situation where the markets have become more dependent on liquidity. And that has its consequences if you do it too fast, too abruptly. And uh, we saw the consequences in September 2019 when the Fed had to go back in uh, to infuse liquidity, arguably, and uh, uh, there is a link between what happened in, in uh, Britain with the LDI crisis and uh, and uh, some of the withdrawal of liquidity. So I think you have to be careful, but uh, I, I don't think that's an excuse for not uh, starting the process. Uh, you just have to make sure that it doesn't uh, it doesn't get uh, doesn't overwhelm the market. Maybe if I can add to that. Most of these interventions basically provided massive liquidity when needed most to everyone in the market, and therefore were really like, uh, you know, and over years, uh, if you withdraw that liquidity, as Raghu just said, you almost have to, it has to be almost a non-event. So I think the general uh, rule that central banks follow to basically map out a medium term target and to sort of, you know, in monthly similar intervals, withdraw that liquidity is going to be very important because uh, markets need, because central banks balance sheets now play such a central role in the economy, markets need some reliable guidance on how that liquidity is going to be withdrawn over the medium term. And if you look at projections for the ECB or the Fed, this is a project that will take us probably to the end of this decade to go back to a composition of the monetary base and other monetary uh, aggregates that is largely driven by central bank cash and the usual components as opposed to uh, those uh, components built up over the intervention when market liquidity was injected into the economy. Uh, it also, there's a graph in the, in the, it also led to a massive support for equity markets and for financial markets in general. And there is a question of whether actually this helped uh, sort of uh, maintain inflation around uh, the, the target or whether it has largely been evaporating in financial markets by driving uh, investments and driving equity markets. And I think there's a good point uh, in the future to make central bank policies when the balance sheet is concerned more a reliable policy, in particular on the way down, because central banks need to take themselves out of being the central conduct party in many markets, which they've become over 10 years of interventions. Thank you. Melissa, yours. Thank you very much. Our next question uh, is from Fernando Toledo at the Central Bank of Argentina. What are your opinions about the spillovers of unexpected shocks to monetary policy adopted by the FED on emerging markets and developing economies exchange rate market pressure indexes? Uh, very quickly, I, I think this time it's been much uh, lower uh, than the past for some of the big emerging markets, precisely because, as uh, Marcus uh, said earlier, they've taken actions 
uh, way in advance and prepared themselves for the eventual Fed tightening. Uh, and, and I think it has served them well. Uh, if you look at Brazil, for example, uh, or, or India, they have uh, uh, under, you know, they've experienced uh, a rise in, in Fed interest rates without a commensurate collapse in the exchange rate, which used to be the case in the past. Uh, of course, there are more fragile emerging markets. Uh, not all of them have been able to endure this, but uh, but I think it's important that this time has been a little different. And I would add admirably, uh, if I can say, admirably that the central banks in many emerging markets did that against much more pushback than usual, because basically, uh, they had to convince the governments that what they're doing is the right thing, which turned out medium to long term to be the case, against the policy stance in more of the developed world that was simply heading still in the other direction. And so uh, whilst uh, I think they did the right thing early on, it was harder to do for them this time around because uh, you know, the developed markets were still on a different policy trajectory. And uh, they really put a lot of their uh, fate onto doing this and they got it right. So I do think emerging markets this time around were different. If I may add, uh, indeed, uh, one of the reasons for their uh, improved performance in all dimensions is, if I may put it in quotation mark, they were lucky enough to have their crisis a decade earlier. So the Asian financial crisis of 97, uh, the, the Latin American debt crisis, uh, all of those have been translating themselves in the positive way into building resilience. And once you build resilience, you are able to absorb the shocks in a much better way. Thank you very much. Our next question is from Bagia Garakar at Singapore's Straits Times newspaper. One of your messages was about independence. Would you say there is something worrisome about the current scenario? Could you speak a bit about the context in which we are to receive your remarks? I can perhaps say a few words. I think. Uh... Looking forward, the tensions are, will be more severe because you know the high interest rate will really bite into the budget. And then the question is, you know, how will governments react to that? And it's obvious that the governments will be unhappy about these measures, which are necessary to fight inflation. And it's this leads, you know, to some discussions and some potential blame game and the central bank independence is very important. Then is of course also with the QE measures, if you were to mark the market, the long-term assets, the central banks bought their large losses on the balance sheets, that weakens the central bank's balance sheet potentially. And this one has to take this into account as well. And as I mentioned, the payment on the reserves, on the excess reserves, that some policymakers might see this as you know a huge subsidy to the financial sector and might lead to some financial stuff, might stabilize the financial sector. But if the financial sector pays out huge amounts of dividends and just takes this as gifts and pays it out in form of dividends and high bonus payments, this might not be well received by the policymakers. So I can see tensions coming up and preparing for this, this is like an advanced warning, preparing for this, it's important that the central bank independence is strengthened and also central banks remain well capitalized in this regard. I do think if, if I uh, add one sentence, there is a balancing act as always. Of course, most central bank mandates uh, are designed that central banks need to trade off between inflation and the state of the economy. But there are two side effects that you need to watch. The first one is fiscal dominance, if I want to put it in that framework, that they do not become too strong uh, too strongly influenced by the general stance of fiscal policy. The other one is financial. Uh, uh, dominance, which basically means there's such a core part of financial markets now that the needs of financial markets and the risk of financial stability, uh, which whilst it needs to be kept, uh, you know, inside, uh, should not become an overriding constraint. I really stress overriding constraint for monetary policy, neither the fiscal nor the financial. They need to do what is right in order to get inflation right in the long term, given the state of the economy. And I think that balancing act is what will determine a lot of the interaction of central banks in the next years with markets and fiscal policy. Making. 
let me just let me just add one more uh, point, which is one of the characteristics of central bank policy and of monetary policy is that it operates with legs. And uh, that's always has been the case. Uh, the political system normally operates with a relatively short term horizon because of the political realities. And that's the idea of providing central bank with the ability to be operationally independent so it's not to be pressured with the short-term considerations because of the fact that it is enshrined in them and empowered to do medium-term policies. That's the key for the, for the independence. Now, what we have had in the more recent years has, because of the variety of crises that have led to expansion of debt and large budget deficits, all justified by good political and economic reasons in the short term, now the potential conflict between medium term and short term may be even sharper. And that's where we need to really watch for maintaining the independence of the central bank. Thank you very much. Our next question is from Kamyar Hazaveh at the EDHEC Business School. A question on average inflation targeting that some major central banks adopted pre-pandemic. I would like to know the panel's opinion on this framework. There were at the time many arguments against this framework. Today, it seems no one talks about it much. Axel, I know this is Axel's baby. So we will start with Axel. Well, and then no, I will go because he just started. So and then no, 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 no. Go ahead, Axel. I, you will I, find I, here a chorus of complete agreement. So it doesn't matter who starts. Go ahead. Shoot. No, look, I, I think uh, probably that was a, a framework that once it was announced, central banks were under the belief that the undershooting of their inflation target in the past would give them room to maneuver to allow for somewhat more inflation to come in so that on average their inflation uh, would be on target. Of course, you know, uh, all of these arguments, uh, in my view, contributed to the delayed reaction of central banks to the break of the inflation trend. And there is a, you know, there is a coincidence in the argument looking forward, uh, namely if central banks were concerned about the average performance of inflation, after such a period of a massive hit, overshoot, you know, let, let's remember, I mean, the target of most central banks was around 2%. Uh, we had double digit inflation. And so the argument, if you were to still apply that policy framework, would be that now they have to stay restrictive for longer in order to not just get inflation back to 2%, but to actually undo some of the overshoot that inflation had in the recent period. And that, in my view, would lead you straight into a discussion that whilst currently there is a discussion about lowering interest rates, if average inflation targeting was still the framework they follow, that would naturally have to delay the point in time at which interest rates would be lowered because there is an overshoot to be worked off in order to get back to 2% on average. So uh, the symmetry that applied when this was felt as giving central banks an additional degree of freedom when they were undershooting the target, now turns into an obligation to stay restricted longer uh, because of the overshoot that occurred. And so I do think that central banks, at least in recent period, I haven't heard anybody mention that theory because it would be a clear reason to stay restricted for longer as opposed to easy for longer. I mean, in, in some sense, it was a framework for a different problem, right? It was a framework for a problem where you had to get inflation up at least that was what central banks thought was their the most important concern. And I think as as Axel puts it, you have to be careful about uh, you know adopting frameworks for a specific problem uh, because then you get locked in uh, to that kind of framework when the problem changes. and And more generally, I think as we get out of this and we start looking back at what we can do better, we have to think about what the appropriate framework is. Is it going to be more sort of uh, tolerant of inflation in order to uh, deal with the problem of low inflation? Or is it going to be more intolerant of high inflation 
in order to deal with the problem of high inflation. And unfortunately, I think you can't do both. You have to choose. The earlier framework we had was more intolerant of high inflation. The new framework we have is more uh, sort of uh, tolerant of inflation in order to get inflation up. And I think uh, the Fed will have to go back to examining this to see what kind of changes it needs to make in light of the recent experience. And maybe the answer is low inflation is not so bad. Uh, so long as it doesn't become galloping deflation, I think that's something they'll have to think about. Melissa. I think we have time for one last question. This is from James Cheong uh, in, at HSBC. How can central banks communicate effectively with their public to ensure that their policies are understood and supported. Does anyone want to take a shot at that uh, briefly? Well, to begin with, if uh, I, I, I'm trying to be mischievous, uh, if you have a, a, in some of the central banks there is a board of governors, in some other central banks there is a governor. Uh, so, first of all, to make sure that uh, those who speak for the central banks are very well identified as speaking for the central banks. And it would be very good if there is a view of the central bank that it is formed within the central bank before expressed to the public, rather than having the discussion in public, which creates uh, extra noise and extra guesses of who will do what. And this is not exactly the approach for that helps both transparency and clarity. So that's the, that's the first one. But second, really share as much as possible the way in which central bank reaches its conclusion. Share the model, even if the model is not so clear, share the unclear model in a very, in a very uh, transparent uh, way. In a way, uh, the best, there has been a big change in central banking. Many, many years ago, central bank defined as success if it surprised the market. And if there was a leak, it was, it was a disaster. We are in a different world today. And the best outcome would be that uh, those uh, market participants can actually simulate to themselves the decision and the discussion within the FOMC, within the central bank, and actually almost replicate. And it's a dialogue rather than one is surprising the other. And here, uh, the clarity of the expressions are extremely important and definitely not to sing in different, uh, different voices. Maybe to add one point uh, to Jacob is communication clarity always depends on the sender and the receiver of that message. And I think while central banks were very clear uh, when they raised rates and uh, currently what their stance going forward is, the pricing of the market is something completely different. And so the question here is not as much the clarity of the communication of central banks, because uh, I think they've been very clear. The question is that the market has a different scenario and therefore does price things differently. That's not a communication problem. That's just diverging expectations. And I think as long as central banks are consistent, are very clear in their communication and lay open their framework, uh, the market has the ability to form a view, even if that view differs. Uh, and I wouldn't call that a, a lack of clarity on part of the central bank. Actually, when you go back, uh, you know, the market was actually uh, not on a different page before, before central banks started raising rates. Um, it is on a different page on, uh, on how long this will take. And I think that's where the central bank has to be very clear and stick to their message. I, for example, found that uh, Jay Powell was very clear in his Jackson Hole speech when he signaled the stance, the changing stance of the Federal Reserve. Uh, he was uh, very concrete, very short, and very decisive. And I think that sometimes helps to bring a point across. And so I don't think that uh, clarity of communication has been a big issue this time around. Uh, it's more that there are different perceptions in the market. Thank you so much for all of the thoughtful questions. We have a very engaged audience with us today and we're sorry we couldn't get to everyone's points. Thank you very much for joining us.
So we are going now to say goodbye to everyone. Thank you so much, and we will uh, leave the call. Thanks for attending. Bye-bye.